Hello. Thank you very much, LACNIC and the program committee for allowing me to make this presentation. My presentation is more like a tutorial and also a recommendation of the committee as to how to configure and hopefully you leave here with the idea of setting up a laboratory and using this technology. I am a facilitator of the basic course on DNS at LACNIC's campus and this is a topic that is only touched upon in a very limited way. That is why we came up with the idea of having this, which is a more in-depth explanation. Now, first of all, why block sites? This is a issue that leads to quite a lot of debate. The, this is like a DNS that sort of is lying, but this is to protect the end user. So that is the main goal. And of course, those who are purists can say that a resolver should not be in charge of doing those things. But those of us who operate things are often aware that this is necessary. Now, the first reason is for security reasons. And this is strongly aligned with what the colleague from Mexico was explaining. This is to protect our users from malware, phishing, and other types of abuse. So if there is an infected device or someone clicked somewhere where they shouldn't have done so, it is the DNS that will be in charge of not solving that name and responding with something that is protected by the policies of the company. We also have parental protection. This also has its controversial issues, but this is a technology that has to be showed in a neutral way, and each one can decide how to implement this. In terms of parental blocking or even uh, uh, gaming um, and uh, bets. Uh, and finally, something that is of interest for the people that operate networks is complying with uh, uh, court uh, orders, uh, uh, for instance, like uh, taking you to jail. So these are the reasons and we know that in a region this is becoming increasingly common that is having to comply with uh, uh, orders from government for blocking and this technology is used for that. So why should we use DNS? Because it's cross-cutting. It works for all the protocols. We know that DNS is low level so it's used by web, mail, messaging, apps, uh, Everybody uses DNS, so by blocking it at that level, we protect. Um, it, this is a broader protection, of course. You can also block uh, at a web level using a uh, proxy or through uh, with an ES uh, in the network. So that all it's complementary to those solutions. Another important thing that also causes some confusion is that DNS blocks complete domains the portion of the domain name so you can't uh, distinguish the urls if you wanted to uh, protect a subsection of a web part, uh, you need to use another technology because this blocks the whole thing and of course yeah you have to be careful with legitimate services because abuse you may be planted a phishing uh, device in your site and by using rpz i'm blocking the entire site that may not be bad because the client in the end is a victim too and uh, the victim may realize that there's something wrong and proceed to clean up their site so we reach to rpz this means response policy zones that is um, um how and how does it work well you configure the resolvers of each institution and also related to the previous talk it's very important for each cp to have their own resolver because if not they won't be able to have the control that permits uh, solutions like this so when one of the clients consult for a name that fits the pattern that we have decided uh, defined, then you write a different response and the client doesn't reach the blocked site. The different types of uh, fits of patterns and over uh, writing that we're going to see later on. 
Something important is that this technology has not been standardized in IETF. There was a draft that was quite controversial a while ago, and it's been uh, now it's uh, snoozing, and it's it's been abandoned. But uh, the uh, more common uh, uh, resolvers, the open source resolvers, are there, and the description is in a site where you have the so-called uh, de facto standards where you have the people that created it and a description of how it should work. So you can say that this is going contrary to the usual where a uh, first um, uh, technology uh, well, this is contrary to first being standardized and then adopted, and this is uh, the other way around. Not necessarily should it be wrong. So what are the blockage patterns? What can I intercept? Well, of course, the, the, the first thing is by the name of domain that the client is uh, uh, asking. It may be the, the exact fit or using wildcats. You can so you can uh, have a complete uh, fitter with all the domain and all its offspring and also the name server uh, by the n uh, server of the name used any as i can say that any answer coming from a certain dns should be rewritten this is to avoid attackers that change their names very quickly or they use a very broad space but what they share in common is certain name servers that are infected and that belong to the attacker so n that also that can also be used i don't know whether there was a famous attack of co configure that uh, uh, used um, hundreds or thousands of domains to conduct uh, command and control intercepts but the name servers were fixed so they could be blocked Likewise, we can also block through an IP or a range of IPs. You can analyze, you can solve the name and receive uh, the uh, response, and they can be blocked for the case of in a case of abuse. And finally, because with the client's IP address, this makes sense. For instance, when in a and it, we have ODL services in a residential client, for instance, that can be blocked to avoid any abuses in the recursive name server. What are the overwriting rules? What can I change in the response? In NX domain, I can respond to the client that the domain doesn't exist, and there it will depend. Uh, the reaction will depend on its. Uh, um, the, it's the most likely is that uh, they may receive uh, an ugly window saying you can't reach that site. The no data, well, that there it indicates that the du that the duplo of name and type doesn't exist. For instance, a name with a, a not non data, well, may that may not exist, but uh, there may be others. But from the point of view of the end users, usually, typically, the reaction is the same. It may also be a reaction in which you drop uh, the answer, and then the client stays waiting but will never get anything. And that makes more sense when there are internal attacks, just like the next one that is changing, switching to TCP. You can define that the resolver responds to a very small packet that comes with a T uh, with an active TC bit, and uh, that shows the client that they have to try again using TCP in the hope that it was an internal attack of an infected device. So that uh, causes everything to go slowly, and uh, so uh, you prevent uh, the. Uh, abuse attack and finally changing the response for what we want for that is good for instance if we want to give the feedback to the end user it they may be trying to enter a website with malware we give them a c name with an internal page of the cp and and tcp and they warn that their device may be infected and to get in touch with them so you can have more than one RPZ zone in a resolver. You can decide to have different policies in different parts administered by different people. An important thing of the RPZ zone is that they are true zones. So they um, and uh, 
they can be administered by different people, and you may also have external zones, as it says there. There are people that specialize in putting these zones together, and there are some are paid, others are absolutely free. And here, this fits very well with what you said earlier with uh, the um, of Mexico. There may be institutions that gather intelligence, they realize that there are domains with malware, and they may make this available to the public in general, to their members, these domains in DNS format, so that any anyone can be secondary and to benefit from all this. What happens with DNSSEC? Well, it breaks because we are lying. DNSSEC precisely protects so that nobody is intercepting the response, but a resolver would do it. Now, this is a cost at a cost that a resolver has to has to assume. At the beginning, we always thought that the DNSSEC would be between the resolver, the cache, and the authoritative, so the the end user should be uh, trusting what the, the resolver response. And in this case, if the client wanted to validate, they will realize that the response of the resolver is false. But this is part of the rules that you may have in your organization, in your network. So. Um, uh, mine doesn't break DNSSEC by default. If the client requests validation and the answer comes validated, then bind will not activate the RPZ and will deliver the response. But that you can't, uh, you can configure it. And, and so resolver will break this. Um, so I, th I think that that should be the correct thing. Here I wanted to show the minimum part, uh, uh, making, uh, tr uh, trying with this. Uh, here we have a user that is uh, um, uh, um, asking the resolver with RPZ that uh, gets in touch with the local authoritative with RPZ rules. Now, there may be other servers and internal bind allows you to have an authoritative zone and a recursive zone in the same server with uh, the RPZ rules. But in addition, it can feed from lists of external RPZ. So this would be just this would give you an idea of how to implement it and let's let's see some examples very simple in bind you add a, a, a directive that is called response policy and you point out which is the zone with areas and recommend with this break dnsec the zone well, you have a primary zone with a file, and of course, you allow the consoles, the, the queries to be local. Something that is very important is to add logging, that is just as any other logging directive of mind, you only have to add the RPZ category that is indicating that there I can report any blocks. Um, and here you have an example of how you see a query with, without RPZ here, I'm using a domain name, the people that know EOH and uh, uh, a controversy with Mozilla. This is a domain that people recommend to block. Here we have a query to a local resolver and the local host, and the legitimate answer is those three registries. However, when I apply the changes of an RPZ and I define a zone like this, this is a zone where the rules come. So the upper part is the typical part of any zone with the TTL and DNS. And this, uh, here you have the username of the root and it answers with the X root domain that is part of the protocol, the username. So when somebody Ask for this name, use application DNS. They're going to 
receive a rewriting of the response, something that is important, especially for those that are taking the DNS course. I always speak of pointing dots everywhere because it's one of the first mistakes you make. But it, precisely in RPZ, you don't use it and you would ruin everything if you used it. So what happens after we activate it? Well, it's the same query, but instead of receiving the A registries, I'm going to receive an X domain. An X domain and the status, the NX domain is the important thing. And in addition, as an extra thing, I have an additional registry rec uh, that stating that this was responded using an X uh, set. So the client will ha have to see why um, they couldn't access. And this is what you see in the logs. As I said, this is very important because as you analyze the logs, as we saw earlier, you can analyze and see what are the machines infected and do something about it. So as I was telling you, there are blocked lists uh, that are already available, so you can go directly to the resolver. Some of them are for pay, others are free of charge. I didn't want to include any, but I, I searched for RPZ lists. There are some that are in TXT format that you need to process as they are DNS zones. You can also use all the technology as dynamic up to date updates. So you may have a command line that will add a new rule, not necessarily editing each zone. You can also have an interface uh, giving away so that people from other areas may block things. And as I was telling you, the different Block uh, uh, lists have different approaches. Sometimes you have to sign agreements and sometimes you have to uh, agree to accept it. And here we are re repeating the same. An important thing is that as it is secondary, everything works under the DNS protocol. So everything, the transfers uh, uh, are automatic and you shouldn't worry about this. An important thing is down there at the bottom. It's how important it is to have your own resolver in the organization because this allows me, if I use an external service, I'm subject to its blockades. But for instance, if my government requests me to block a, a local name, I can't go, uh, go and ask Google, for instance, to add that blockage. That is why it's very important to have your own resolver that will enable you to apply those special rules and maybe using a forward and reaching the resolution in an, with an external resolver. That can also be done. Future situations, IETF standardization, hopefully this can be reactivated to has this seal and this is something that hadn't been prepared. This is precisely what was mentioned previously. The people who prepare lists of rules, it would be very easy to publish these as zones and then invite them to use these. These can be blocked as is the case of any transfer with IP addresses. So we can reach all the levels of authentication and privacy one wishes. So that would be all. Thank you very much. This is the address with all the details on the protocols. Thank you. Gracias, Hugo. Thank you, Hugo. I have a question, uh, Jordi Pallet. I was quite surprised about something for many years. Now I had read our RPZ and I understood that transition had been stopped. It was the implementation of BIND. Now I was quite surprised about something that I'm not so clear whether this has to do with the specific blocking or for an entire server that put break DNSSEC. Yes. Yes, this is for the answers that those will be blocked. This is only for those that will be blocked. Yes, but I have the impression that in the options file of the bind, I'm not quite sure whether you can put a break DNSSEC yes, because when we use DNSSEC, 
six, six, four, we have to put DNS sec, no. So I would like to know whether this is compatible or not, or whether this is an incompatibility that has to be tackled when we reach standardization at IETF. Okay, good point. So at least the syntax we have here has been approved, and that works, but we'd have to see how this performs. Thank you. Hello, hello Ugo. Very interesting, the issue of RPZ. I think this can be easily applied, and it's most useful and simple to use. But many of us have been trying to use this and implement this for quite some time now. Now, maybe this is an interesting topic to add. When you do re-addressing, when you do RPZ, and you apply this in organizations or internally in organizations, it's interesting to send it a captive portal to notify the user that they're trying to access a site that is not correct and saving hundreds of calls and so on. Yes, that's a good idea. And if we wish to take further action in addition to just blocking, the C name allows you to do that. You have an alias to any other site. And maybe there is a technique that allows you to detect what the original request was. We'll have to check that. We have a remote question from Henry Godoy. I understand that this blocking can be done by the ISP to protect its users. The question is, to what extent does this action interfere with the principle of internet neutrality? Yes, great. This is the issue that I was referring to. I think that the rules uh, use internally at each organization is involved in this. The end user can then decide to use another external resolver and then not, uh, overcome what the organization is proposing. But the issue of network neutrality, I understand that this depends on each legislation. What we see here is how can we bring to terms the purity of the internet and the protocol versus protection? Now, unfortunately, that train has already left and we cannot go back. But there are, there could be some difficulties in defining this, but as I was saying, this is neutral technology and we should all decide whether to use it or not. Thank you. Mr. Hugo, Roberta Alvarado. I was, I would like to refer to the issue of neutrality today. We are often full of good ideas and poor implementations. In general, the feeds of the blacklist are in the hands of people, and we say whether they're good or bad. I have had a full ASN in a blacklist just because of one IP. So to what extent can this interfere or to what extent would the ISP like to protect the users? A feed of domains initially can publish a random domain, but what would occur if the malware is hosted in Microsoft or in Google Cloud or in AWS? Nobody would wish to block a, such a large provider, at least in Chile, if we have a principle in the legislation, this is network neutrality. So the firewalls and pit holes are all things that we have, but the proposal to the ISPs, as our colleague was saying in the remote question, is to what extent should we interfere and to what extent can uh, this be applied in the home that is fine but if i go up to the isp level i am deciding for the entire network and the entire amount of users what is good or what is bad so those are the decisions that we have to make and this is something that we have discussed 
extensively at the meeting we had in Santiago. They have a resolver that blocks this, but blocks this to what extent? And who does this zone belong to somehow? What do you think in this regard? So, yes, like you were saying, in an organization or in a home, this might be meaningful. And that is a point. You have to be as close as possible to the end user or as close as possible to an organization that has the autonomy. That is why using a list blindly to be prepared from someone outside and in a legislation might not be meaningful. But if you receive a legal order, you have to comply with this. One has to decide how far one goes. Thank you. This could give rise to an entire panel. Thank you very much, Hugo. I have a very brief question. What would occur if you use a C name response with an overwriting? What occurs with the SSL certificate? Is this broken? No, that is valid because a C name aims at a new name and the certificate should have the new name. I understand that would be the case because if you receive a C name, you'll have a request with a new name and that should have a correct certification with the destination. So, a round of applause for Aura.